So we are five past 11. I think it is safe to start. Okay. Is it good for you? Sure. Yeah. All right. I'll mute myself. Take it away. Okay. So <laughs> lead. Letterpress Educators of Art and Design fosters a network of letterpress educators to facilitate sharing of knowledge and expand connections in the community. We provide opportunities to engage discourse, advance research and scholarship, and work to expand understanding of the value of letterpress education as an essential practice in contemporary learning. We, as several of the founders of LED, will share the role of letterpress in education today, including during a global pandemic and our individual goals for teaching letterpress. I'm Erin Beckloff, and I teach letterpress printing as a part of the communication design program at Miami University. And I'm Catherine Fries. I teach at the University of Indianapolis, and our letterpress program is part of the Studio Art Program and is named Hull Blue Press. And I'm Vida Sacic, and I'm the Associate Professor of Art and Graphic Design in the Art and Design Department at Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago. I'm David Walski. I'm an assistant professor in the College of Visual Arts and Design at the University of North Texas in Denton, and I teach communication design and book art. Letterpress in higher education is primarily taught as a part of the divergent fields of studio art, book arts, printing history, and design, as well as through community workshops, printing museums, and archives. Early on as an educator establishing my research and teaching practice, I felt somewhat isolated by the obscurity of my work within my institution. I sought opportunities for collaboration with those who were in a similar situation as myself, letterpress educators who value the printing process. I began organizing events to foster connections with fellow educators, starting with a 2017 panel presentation, Unconventional Conventional, at the UCDA Design Education Summit. The 2017 UCDA panel reinforced the necessity for a strong community of like-minded educators. I had just accepted a position in the College of Visual Arts and Design at the University of North Texas. To earn tenure at this research-focused institution, I needed to identify peer-reviewed forums for the kind of multidisciplinary activities my studio and teaching practices were centered around. Before UNT's letterpress studio became operational in the fall of 2019, I was transporting my own tabletop presses and wood type to campus for in-class workshops with my communication design students. These workshops give students a tangible way of experiencing the links between historical and contemporary design vocabulary and practices. They also provide opportunities to explore 2D design elements and principles through practical applications of type as line, shape, and form, authentic textures, subtractive color, and the spatial implications of physical type, spacing, and leading. In addition to teaching typography and graphic design classes for the Department of Design, I also teach book art through the Department of Studio Art. Last fall, I was able to introduce my book art students to the newly operational letterpress studio. Using the college's Vandercook 4, the students printed wood type from my personal teaching collection and converted the prints to slip cases for one of their artist books. In my own hybrid practice, I combine the traditions of letterpress and printmaking with digital tools and design thinking. Two questions that drive my creative research include, how might I use letterpress to contribute to contemporary typographical discourse? And what new typographic forms exist within a collection of antique wood type? Like my badass colleagues, I believe that letterpress printing is vital and thoroughly relevant. And thanks to their energy and enthusiasm, intelligence and immense talent, a forum now exists for us to support, validate, and promote our research, scholarship, and creativity. 
In 2018, the invitational event, Make Ready, a letterpress symposium for educators, was held at Hamilton Woodtype and Printing Museum in Two Rivers, Wisconsin, co-planned with program officer Stephanie Carpenter. Having met through other letterpress activities, an initial group of 16 educators were invited to come together to share their creative and scholarly production, research, and teaching. The symposium inspired convivial discussion and enthusiasm for another event. Last summer, co-planned with Allison Fisher, Make Ready, Bold and Bright edition was held at Globe Collection and Press at Maryland Institute College of Art, MICA, in Baltimore. 26 educators from the US and UK attended. In addition to presentations focused on scholarship and teaching, the event included a day of field trips with a visit to see the Linotype Machine stained glass window at Otmar Mergenthaler's church. Make Ready 2020 was to be hosted by the London College of Communication letterpress technicians and graphic and media design faculty in hopes of expanding connections with the UK and international letterpress community. But as we started to form a community through the first two Make Ready events, tackle big questions and make plans for Make Ready 2020, a pandemic hits. This moment creates pause and we realize the implications. For many of the letterpress educators, within hours, if not days, we had to make the abrupt shift to remote teaching and learning. We lost access to our studio spaces and specialized equipment such as presses and type. Studios once hustling and bustling with the activity, students and work became empty. Students dispersed to their halls and homes and we educators had to find a way forward. How would we teach letterpress printing? an important and integral part of our teaching and our students' learning without having access to type or printing presses. This was a big and looming question that each of us, the letterpress educators, were facing. My school went remote with only one day of warning. Valuing the printing community as a source of strength and support, I began organizing virtual meetings for camaraderie and commiseration. Having extended from my Make Ready database of letterpress educators, the initial list had grown to 150 individuals. We've had over 20 casual conversation sessions, also known as letterpress educators chats since March. This was a new place, um, but with familiar and new faces. This digital doorway did not find confinement um, by travel or cost. We could gather as a community from far and wide and while that option was always available to us, necessity opened the door. In a new way, it became a hub for engagement and broke us from the isolated bubbles that we now found ourselves in. These virtual conversations became centers for discussions on programs, both thriving and surviving, support regarding concerns, be it COVID related or institutional, created access points and provided group-based troubleshooting, and the exchange and pooling of resources. It felt similar to previous Make Ready's, but included new and more varied voices. As we met, we were able to talk through the transformation of objectives from a studio space with presses and type to a MacGyver means of working. We had to act quickly, grappling with the immediate transition from a letterpress studio to an online space. Our methods had to be inventive, often utilizing high and low tech solutions that acted as surrogates. Letterpress is a medium and process that allows for physical application of a multitude of essential concepts, such as but not limited to the use of a grid, subtractive color, transparency, modularity, the power of the press through messaging, typography, and so much more. These adaptations could not replace letterpress printing, but made the core concepts accessible and feasible for this moment. It also opened a dialogue for me and my students to the importance of being a problem solver, adapting and innovating ways to continue our artistic practice under any circumstances. These conversations also opened and reinforced the importance of community. While we, the educators, gathered in support of one another, we shared how we crafted means for and created opportunities to talk about engagement with other and various communities, be that our students in the resident halls or on campus, the neighborhoods we occupied or the classrooms that lived in digital space. We showed up for each other, be that through exchange speakerships, online tutorials or virtual tours or demonstrations. 
The stories from the letterpress educators chat spoke of student engagements, both their struggles and their triumphs. It mentioned collaborative projects, new materials and applications, work mailed back and forth, and new spaces that acted both as press bed and message board, such as these window messages created by students. Now more than ever, we needed our community and a hub to create and engage in the dialogue about letterpress education. The values and, letter, the values and lessons of letterpress seem more apparent and the need to troubleshoot in the long term was making itself obvious. This solidified and encouraged the founders of LED to go ahead with Make Ready 2020 in a new format. Unable to meet in London as hoped, we decided to shift to that virtual event. We, we were able to learn and converse with letterpress educators from Pasadena to London, Veracruz to Glasgow, Toronto to Sao Paulo, much like we all are for ATIPI. Collective advocacy and supporting fellow educators, nurturing a diverse, equitable, and inclusive community is essential to the survival of letterpress printing, and hosting Make Ready virtually was a great opportunity to do just that. The adaptation to a remote event allowed us to expand, expand our event efforts and goals. We hosted a five-day event, had 150 plus participants from 13 countries who, with a group that were able to share resources, sources, continue to troubleshoot and also commiserate. 35 speakers presented about their research and teaching. We took virtual tours of workshops and museums. We also had really great conversations within breakout rooms, which were utilized for both social time and to make new connections. In the few days that we gathered online, we were able to hear from educators from all over the globe in varied circumstances. We shared previous works related to teaching and scholarly research, possible solutions to current problems, and the desire to continue our community engagement. The necessity of the moment gave us a new platform, and it brought forth both the struggles and triumphs of the community as a whole. Make Ready 2020 was well received and provided many of us the boost needed to find pathway forward for the fall of 2020 and the new academic year. For me, the LED collective discussions and the Make Ready 2020 experience reinvigorated my commitment to the process I love. I felt and still feel supported. While I'm proud of my, my personal institution and appreciate the efforts they are making to assist us with the pandemic, I'm the only person on my campus teaching this process and finding that way forward. With the support of my new colleagues from around the world, I was able to collaborate, support, build relationships, and solve complex problems. It was sometimes the case that during the week I would speak to and plan with my lead colleagues more than my institutional ones. This is not a criticism of the latter, but a testament to the former and the communal efforts that of its educators and the current custodians to successfully navigate this discipline of letterpress through its next chapter in history. Letterpress printing, simply put, is an integral part of my program, our programs, our department, and our students' learning and experience. Among these experiences of the chats and Make Ready 2020, I was able to find ways that reaffirmed my commitment to my shop, my students, my community, and reimagined the classroom spaces, whether that meant face-to-face -face experiences or ones that brought the studio to the students. When that wouldn't work, we helped each other make a plan to bring the print shop to the students like Catherine mentioned. We knew that we couldn't be in our spaces. It was also Coming together was an affirmation of our, of our shared core objectives, values, and passion for letterpress that propelled us to consider new formats while honoring the original methods. We found ways to make it work. It wasn't easy by any means, printing from school or printing from home, depending on the possibilities for the fall for our students and for our own facilities, which changed again within a day or week's notice. Some faculty members produced supply kits of tools and materials of varying scales, but that was highly dependent on funding availability and time. There have been joys and satisfaction, including my students building their own presses via Zoom. And as much as we've done to host a related experience, we've realized that nothing can replace the original intended experience of doing letterpress together. We're still overcoming challenges 
that have included students building their own presses and having never used a screwdriver before. Um, compiling materials takes time and energy that we're all running low on. Sometimes the outcomes have taken a turn. We've had to pivot. It's been hard, but it's reminded us of the importance of our letterpress studios and the practice of letterpress. It hasn't been without issues. Yeah, when we moved to online instruction, we were faced with the reality that many of our students don't have access to technology that's available in the classroom. And here I speak not only of the printing technology, but also computers. Um, computers that would provide the ability to run software like the Creative Suite, which is what we use to replace some of the things that we were doing in the print shop. So we tried making our own three-dimensional printing type. We tried using everyday materials. We had fun, but the results didn't always meet our standards. And we remained, we remained connected to each other um, as a class, but we missed the equalizing physical presence of being in an egalitarian classroom. Um, so all of this Zoom activity made us question um, this idea of the future of education as online education and think that if that is some of the future of education, then all students should be provided free technology. However, um, would that really constitute education or is there more to be desired than that? So I teach at Northeastern Illinois University, which is a regional public university in Chicago. And we have one of the most diverse group of students in the Midwest. And they also graduate with significantly less debt. So this mix of economically and ethnically diverse students is at the core of the identity of my school and our class. And we have sometimes fewer resources. We only have two printing presses in our letterpress studio, uh, Vandercook SP15 that was there when, we, uh, when I came 10 years ago. And we've since acquired an additional larger Vandercook 320. Um, but those are only two presses for classes that often have 20 people. So we have to share those resources. And some of that is in, works in our favor because um, we are basically people that have to work together, that have to communicate. Um, this experience makes us more successful and ultimately it makes us good problem solvers. Um, and I think that continuing to teach letterpress under these circumstances is crucial for students because we're building an understanding of history of print and history of communication and we're thinking about a set view for the future, but we're also learning to share resources. And um, this is especially relevant for this group of diverse students because so much of the American Midwest printers, you know, are not as inclusive as they could be. And we wonder if the American Midwest printing community could invite more people of color and more, more non-native English speakers to their table. So the question is how can we encourage and support students so that they have access to both unique tools, which is the letterpress type of situation, um, but also everyday tools that still remain out of reach of so many people. As we're moving into the next semester, the spring, I'm teaching typography too. So I am going to be documenting my own efforts in redrawing and recreating a new version of a typeface that's um, been originally drawn by an overlooked typographer, Olga Hecker, who created a typeface that incorporates features of glagolic, Latin, and Cyrillic script. So I'm sharing my own work of redrawing um, underdocumented type with my students. And I'm working with more wood type on cutting key characters of this typeface that I've named Hecker after the original author. Uh, I'm going to be cutting them out in wood. So I plan to share the characters with my typography students this spring. And I plan to print it often in my own studio where I have access to my own technology, um, another Vandercook printing press. 
But meanwhile, I hope to um, resume letterpress class in 2021, at least partially in person. We're hopeful. Um, and the reason to really look forward to returning to the classroom and to the type shop is because this access to tools is crucial. The tools that are offered in physical space cannot be substituted completely with um, digital technology, even though it can be augmented and shared through digital means. But um, printing calls us to slow down, and it's such an important and beautiful process. It introduces elements of chance and discovery to the work that we're making. And it gives students access to tools that were historically reserved to only be accessed by those with privilege. So an egalitarian classroom is what we look forward to coming back to. And I'm thrilled to see what happens when access to tools is reestablished and even expanded. The pandemic situation has expedited expansion and formalization of our organization led. Opportunities continue to grow for expanded and deeper connections among printing educators through sharing resources and expertise, communicating the benefits of the letterpress experience through the strength of our international collective. If you would like to learn more or become involved, please, please visit our website, letterpresseducators.com. At our most recent collective discussion, we came away with questions about how to move forward. The most important being, how can we ensure the future of letterpress as a vital component of contemporary art and design education. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, that was so great. <laughs> Let me remove the slides by now. Yeah, <laughs> I can see all of you big on the screen. Oh, yeah. What can I say? So. It's really interesting to see that during such difficult times, you're still trying to find ways to, to continue to get the students interested in the topic, which I think is us. It's, I, I faced the same, uh, like a similar situation in Australia. I'm teaching at the Newcastle University. And then we do have like, as well a makerspace that are not only for letterpress, but also so kind of all the kind of different printings. And then, uh, yeah, the first thing was, what should we do with the space and how to get the students still engaged with this, uh, this kind of hands-on activities? Because nowadays they hardly know how to cut a paper, right? So if, right. You, don't, <laughs> if you don't kind of force them to, to get, to put the hands-on, they sometimes they don't, do, they don't know even to do the basic things. And I, I, uh, I'll wait for the questions on the chat, but I will kick start with this thing about how it was to make this like to, to make via Zoom to create a printing press about the process? How how did, how did was the experience from the student point of view? Did they enjoy doing it? Or how it was? They looked really happy. I was um, one of the a lot of educators that ended up choosing to use that provisional press ended up um, building them and then having the students take them but i decided having a shop teacher father that i would just go for trying to help them build them on their own and there were challenges for sure we glued things backwards we had to send replacement parts but they really understand how their presses work because they constructed every part of it and so they're they're able to adapt better i think i stressed about it more than they did because i did have them turn on their cameras if they're comfortable and, and point it down. But I mean, we're holding it up to show like which way they're holding the screwdriver and if things are straight and parallel. So I think it, I think it was overall a huge success, but definitely anxiety inducing for the professor. <laughs> <laughs> and that was their, uh, for that student, uh, they, was that their first experience with letterpress or did they have uh, time to do it that on the studio before the pandemic? Unfortunately, that group, we just started this fall. So they all became new um, new communication design majors and they had never used the press. They'd also, many of them never built anything before, even mm -hmm. Ikea furniture. So yeah, brand new printers. Catherine's using the press in a similar way for her students. Yeah, I, I had a different experience just because um, we got those presses for our advanced students. So they had already had experience printing, but obviously had never purchased or even considered buying a press to put together. So um, 
we, we started off with at least a basic knowledge of how a printing press should work. Um, but like Aaron said, we've had to troubleshoot a lot of things uh, to get them to put it together, but they did a great job. And I think uh, one of the things that we can all agree upon uh, with letterpress is that getting to kind of pull that first print is a magical experience that can be very um, uh, seductive. And I think the idea of building your own printing press just kind of furthered that, uh, furthered that more um, when we couldn't be in the print shop to, to pull that first print together. Really nice. And also, I think it, it is interesting that makes them be aware of the work of the technician that mm -hmm. actually have to level up and prepare the machine for them. Because usually when you do, when you just go into the studio, we use it and leave the mess to them. Or if something is not working, they do their job and then magically things start to happen again. So I think it's also re that's really, really interesting to see that they have the awareness of that. I think the, the provisional press also mimics so many styles of proof presses. And I'm sure all, all of us have had a moment where we've had to go over and troubleshoot with a student what was not working properly. And by building it themselves, they were more intimately aware of what could go wrong and how what parts to look at when certain problems arose. I think it also encourages self-sufficiency. Um, you know, as as letterpress printers, we all have to we all have to figure this stuff out. And when the press breaks down. We're the we're the repair person, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was interesting you mentioned technicians. That's been something we've all been learning as our international communities expanded. Different schools and different even community workshops are set up different ways. And so in the UK, you have um, letterpress technicians that that's their their full time job to help facilitate the students getting to use the equipment safely, but. At, in the US, that's us too. So we're professors and we're maintaining the studios at the same time. So our students are given a lot of responsibility in the studios too, and lots of safety safety lessons and procedures taught and things like that. So it's been, we've learned a lot from each other's methods as we've had mm -hmm. these chats and, and make ready too. Yeah, and I'm also wondering if it was the case that some students were kind of giving feedback to the others in a way to improve their presses, or let's say if they're not getting like a proper result, did that happen during the process of one giving tips to to each other? So oh, maybe if you're trying to level it up in a different way or using a different paper, how was that process? Yeah, I think that always happens. I've noticed that there are students that are that take to physical design processes quicker than others. I think that happens both with provisional presses and with in our letterpress studios at our schools. And I think that's a really nice uh, confidence boost because sometimes the students that are really successful digital designers don't pick up letterpress printing quite as quickly. And so I always enjoy seeing the camaraderie and communal learning that happens both through Zoom, still happening, but especially in the studios. Yeah, nice. And I got a, a question here from Gloria. That what did the students use for type on their provisional type press? So how was that? That was one of the struggles. Um, so we laser cut and laser cut wood type, wood type, quote unquote, out of birch veneer plywood. So they're just little tiny, uh, thin letter forms, which get mounted to a gridded base. Um, the challenge was they were using, students are using uh, baby oil for the most part because they're at home um, as their solvent. And so we were getting to a point where the adhesive tape was no longer working to attach their letters to the base. So thinking about new materials, thinking about introducing acrylic, but there is something really nice about the translation between wood type and wood letters. But yeah, it's... Um, I borrowed this from one of our letterpress educator colleagues, uh, Marnie, who said this was going to be an experimental collaborative semester. And so we've really embraced that whole, like, I'm learning how this works as you're learning how this works. And I've been very upfront with students about that the whole time. Nice. I was wondering if those kind of scrapbooking kits, they might have some letters as well that sometimes they do sell it. Mm -hmm. an alternative as well. Nice. I'd like to have a question. Yeah, I had a question for ahead. Catherine, because uh, you, your students were also, That's... your seniors or advanced mm -hmm. students were using the provisional presses. Mm -hmm. um, were you were you printing with type or were you printing with uh, other relief blocks? 
Yeah, so we've actually used it a number of different ways. We've done the same system with Aaron with the gridded base and the wood veneer type. We've had students carving wood and linoleum and using this press for it, including type forms um, or typography out of those, those hand carved uh, uh, matrices. We've also um, rigged it with the the base that Aaron was talking about and some foam craft sheets that almost act like the blankets on an etching press to do various monotypes um, and masking and um, additive and subtractive processes. So we've kind of used that press for lots of different <laughs> methodologies um, because for, for, for me and my students, Letterpress lives in our printmaking program. So it's a combination of things. Thanks, David. <laughs> Gloria mentioned that she's also seen Legos being used to create type and illustration as well as refrigerator magnet letters. So yeah, people are being really innovative and also could just cutting foam and chipboard and just whatever they have to make prints. So yeah. Great. And also I have a question from Ann Bassman. Hi, Anne. Uh, so is how much do you think the students need to be technicians experiencing letterpress? And if so, would you say the students get inspired by this technique or rather they are disencouraged to get involved in letterpress? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A good one. <laughs> yeah, that is a good one. I don't, I think it's really well framed as well. That's a really well framed question because, you know, I think everybody's opinion is probably different, but and every student tends to be a little different as well, of course. But, um, you know, overall, I would personally say that I don't think they, the students need to be technicians at all to experience letterpress. Um, and I also think some of them are attracted by the technical process, but many are kind of repelled by the process as well. And in turn, that kind of... Um, the difficulty in accessing content through this process mm -hmm. provides provides something they can push against and provides an obstacle that becomes fruit that becomes a point of creation for them mm -hmm. essentially so it's kind of like that like like you know it, it's like um fruitful obstacle right so i think i have this marcus aurelius quote on my mind the impediment to action advances action what stands in the way becomes the way Right. So I, I think I was one of those students that was really uh, resistant to the technical experience at first. And then I found that to be um, interesting to me. So I relate to students, you know, who who kind of fight against it. I think there's something really interesting in that tension. And I tend to um, like encourage people to do it, to don't want to do it. And then I'm really interested in that friction that happens. Vita, I'm curious if you've if you've found strategies for working with those students who um, are initially resistant. I mean, does, does your your own experience uh, provide some insight into some ways that you can encourage them? Absolutely. I think you just don't talk about it in terms of letterpress. You just talk about the project. So instead of talking about the press and the the you know the bits you start to talk about what it is that they want to say and the minute you start to talk about like that's why they're that's why a lot of the time those are my favorite students because they're into the work you know and then the work kind of grows out of working with this process so um so yeah i i try to i try to like get them to talk about what it is that they want to make and then they just have to make it in letterpress and it's ends up being better for it <laughs> nice. and also david i i like what you did to make them to go digital late afterwards like getting this as a first stage and then moving forwards so because i think that it gets along with this thing about being technicians at the same point that some of them might be blaming the technology in the sense mm -hmm. of saying, oh, my printing press is not good enough, so that's why I didn't achieve the results. Mm -hmm. But I think by putting, putting them on that task as well, gives more maybe the creative freedom and also the responsibility mm -hmm. to be both. And then maybe that they are actually on charge. But sometimes yeah. they, when they do like a workshop, they just try to mimic in the best way possible. But in that way, I think they have had more creative power. So I can expand that, David, a little bit about how it was experience of maybe even get the flaws that you get on the ink when you move digital, if they try to fix it or they try to embrace it, how it was the process? 
Um, well, I find that most graphic design students are actually more interested in the flaws <laughs> um, and the distressed look. Uh, and so I, I, I use that as an opportunity to talk about um, historical practices because traditionally letterpress printing uh, discouraged that kind of aesthetic. Um, if you look at uh, historical type specimens, you're not going to find distressed wood type or beat up metal type. It's all in perfect condition. Um, so it's not so much, a, uh, the challenge isn't so much in getting them to embrace that, um, but to uh, really think about why they're using it. Um, because um, I know for many of us, and especially in my own practice, I'm not, I'm not particularly interested in reproducing um, history. I, I mean, Printers throughout history have they perfected the the process and their technique. Um, I'm more interested in why we use letterpress and the value um, that it offers for a contemporary designer or practitioner. Um, so I, I think it's a it's a great opportunity to talk about concept and to talk about um, the meaning behind. Um, using the processes that we use. Fantastic. And also I have a comment here from Anna Sophia like about embracing perfection as a distinctive feature. feature. Yeah. Yes, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Anna, for, Anna for, for the comment. And also for, from Rafael from Brazil, because uh, uh, he, he said he's been trying to figure out how to translate the measures in inches to our reality in Brazil. So, yeah, and also Rafael has been doing some interesting work with uh, trying to recreate wood type by using some kind of Brazilian uh, wood. And mm -hmm. he did talk about this, I think, in HIPI Antwerp, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting that we're trying, of course, as, as you said, David, the people from the past already mastered the way how to do it. Yeah. And now if you're just trying to, just trying to mimic, you're just, we you always be behind them. Yeah. So yeah, it's good when you're trying to go this to in, to create new meanings mm -hmm. and trying to make new new ways and uh, and also I think uh, I like to make a comment as well about this thing of sending the uh, the artwork to people by mail, mm -hmm. which I think is yeah it uh, kind of gives me back to the idea of the handwritten letters, mm -hmm. like how we miss it, this thing by email and how it was to have a physical letter that when people that it's kind of have the human touch. It's something that we desperately need right now. So I, I really love this idea of sending artworks to other people so they can, it's almost like that you're kind of getting back to have human interactions. Yeah. So yeah, I think, yeah, lovely idea to, to do that. I hope we can do more and more of that. So yeah, we are, let's say, we, we have to wrap it up quite soon, but yeah, do a, if you have like your final thoughts or even anybody else, also Anna Sophia also asked it on the chat, if you also have any experiment doing polymer plates did any of you yes <laughs> yeah i think i don't we have a photopolymer plate maker that we um also use for our graphic design and letterpress students mm -hmm. yeah our program has a polymer plate maker uh but it wasn't it wasn't set up before um the pandemic um but Prior to teaching at UNT, uh, I've taught at other institutions where we've had access to plate makers, and that's that's been a a part of my teaching practice for a number of years. Yeah, I think we've seen a lot of really innovative ways people have adapted just in this seven month period. But we've also it's been great to see the way people have um, found ways to use new technology paired with, I guess, traditional technology like printing presses, wood and metal type, but just looking at how 3D printing and laser cutting and those those methods and processes can, can be paired in photopolymer, like looking at the relationship between all of those and then also bridging, using letterpress printing as a bridge from the physical to the digital and often back again. And so that's a really vital connection that we're making for with our art and design students when they're taking letterpress classes.
Well, and so many examples came up in the chats. Uh, the provisional press is a perfect example, but there were many others where these were kind of side projects for these educators, that something that they were working on for a long period of time, um, but the necessity expedited the work and it made it available and accessible to not just them and their students, but to students all over. Um, so that exchange, I think, is really been beneficial and we've all been beneficiaries of that exchange and um, it's been exciting to see work that's been going on for for a long time but having a new a new purpose all right yeah so i'd like to thank you all for for this I, i'm hoping maybe we can have a follow-up by next year when you go for the next i type pi so you can see how it goes for the next stages and Hiya. how was the follow-up oh, we have we have somebody here Hi. Wanna say hi? Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yeah, like this thing here, everybody doing like home printing and so on. So yeah, maybe we can have this topic again on next uh, next year, and mm -hmm. uh, we can join now maybe the hangout room if people that uh, we've been doing that, so we can catch up and the others can participate via camera as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you very much, and thanks especially for for going forward during this kind of quite difficult times. And yeah, it was really good chat. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Thanks for having us. I'll try to find you. Hi. Hi. To you to... All right. <laughs> See you later. Bye. 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 Say bye as well. <laughs> Say bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you.